So I put a subtitle here, suffering, do we have to? And do I have to is when, if you have uh, young kids or your kids were young at one point, that is the question that you get asked. Do I have to? Do we have to uh, clean up, uh, finish your food? And the answer is, do we have to? So I put a subtitle here, suffering, do we have to? So I will go through the, the slides. Uh, and the slides, forgive me, they are a bit scattered. Uh, but I hope that this is just to trigger some conversation points. Okay, so I will go over it. And forgive me if you've heard some of, of this before or you've heard it all before. Okay, so the perspective on suffering. Uh, I have put a couple of perspectives here. I'm going to share them with you. Sometimes it's just an argument that suffering is used as an argument. And the argument is put like this. Does God exist? Yes, no. Is he all powerful? Yes, no. Uh, is he all loving? Yes, no. And then, of course, uh, the, the argument goes, uh, does God exist? And we answer and say, yes. Is he all powerful? Yes. Is he all loving? Yes. And then the question, uh, there should be no room for evil. And I'm sure you, you heard this argument before. Uh, I don't know if you notice any trick in the last line, in the fourth bullet here. Because that usually happens very suddenly when, when you're talking to someone about, about the problem of suffering. Anyone? You can put it in a chat or you can unmute yourself. Do you see how I transition the, the issue from suffering to evil? You see, it is, the argument starts with suffering. Yeah. But the person will take you into uh, uh, suddenly or by accident or by design to take you from suffering to answer the question of evil. And they join suffering and evil. And hopefully towards the end of the discussion, today's discussion, we'll be able to delineate or figure out, you know, where, where this these connect or disconnect okay the following perspective is suffering as a question from without someone is outside suffering seeing someone suffering and do they why does God allow suffering it's like uh, almost like a mental exercise or a question oh ya haram why is this person why is this happening to that person but I think the toughest struggle is when the question is from within why does God allow? Why does God allow me to suffer? Because uh, it turns from an intellectual exercise to an existential issue. Why am I suffering? So those are the three views, three perspectives that usually deal with the issue of suffering. Some people set it up as an argument against God. Some people set it up as an intellectual stimulation. You know, you're having coffee, you're bored. Or you see someone suffering and you start questioning. But the third one is maybe the most intense one. So since suffering is a central thing in our life, is suffering avoidable? But it, I guess we all, young and old, we can attest to the fact that suffering is not avoidable. Suffering is not avoidable in terms of uh, losing loved ones. If we if we suffer early, we die young. If we stay around, we live a very long life, and we see those around us die one by one, and we see that there is that suffering, the breaking down of companionship. There is suffering of disease, suffering of uh, accidents, uh, suffering of from evil. But there is another subtle, very, very subtle suffering. And it, it results when we actually try to avoid suffering. And we live our life and we change our worldview into something that I'll do whatever I can to avoid suffering. And that turns to be a very tough kind of suffering to live with. So it's not actually the pain, but the fear of pain. 
And that is a, a harder type of pain to deal with. And it's unescapable. It's unescapable. So we can see that suffering either comes to us or we try to run away from it and, and running away from it, we create some kind of suffering. So it is there. It's not avoidable. Uh, then suffering cannot be looked at away from worldviews. So I put here a few worldviews. I think they, I don't think they are exhaustive, but maybe they, just share with me your thoughts if you. So there is the materialistic, naturalistic view where uh, accident, we're part of its DNA, its randomness that we live in, and it's suffering is just going to happen because of a chance. And I think it's uh, Richard Dawkins who says uh, we dance to our DNA. I think that's the expression he uses. So of course, he's the he's the god of all atheists and he, he just sees nothing but chance and DNA that doesn't, this worldview doesn't deal with suffering. It just says, okay, whatever, you're here by chance life sucks live here and you're gonna move on and or you don't move on you die and you that's it so that doesn't deal with suffering there is also the pantheistic worldview which is uh, adopted by the eastern religions and either they uh, they consider suffering as part of paying for previous lives paying for previous uh, sins or uh, way to be purified so that's maybe in Hinduism in Buddhism uh, you suffer because you want you suffer because you have a desire if you don't have a desire if you shed all the desires you shed with that all suffering but of course suffering still remains and suffering is very real and then there is the agnostic so you know what don't bother me. I don't know. I don't want to know. I'm just living. Still suffering is not answered. And then we have the transcendent view. Transcendent view is where we don't believe that what we're living now is all that is. There is more beyond what we're seeing. There is more beyond what, we, what we're living. It transcends time. It transcends space. It transcends our uh, current conditions and current situations and those are maybe the the religions that look into life after uh, of course uh, if you know that in the in the pantheistic views you don't keep your personality you get absorbed into that universe you get absorbed into back into the universe into that energy into the force but I thought also about the transcendent. I just put a slide, uh, and I called it here, not all transcendent created equal. And I'm going to present you here with a few uh, propositions from one worldview that is con called, maybe considered to be transcendent. So a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. God wants people to be good, nice, fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. God doesn't need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Good people go to heaven when they die. What do you think? Any insight, feedback? What do you think of this? This is like a set of beliefs of a transcendent worldview. Sorry. Anyone heard? Sorry. I'm actually not sure if I understand the, the the term transcendent. I'm sorry, I might be a little bit ignorant here, but um, I'd like to learn that from you. Yeah, so trans transcendent means that we it, 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 we go beyond the here and now. 
that our existence transcends uh, our life here. There is an afterlife. There is there is more to come that we don't see. So we are going beyond what we are living here. So that's what transcendent is. Sorry, it's and, not only the here and now that is. Sure. Like St. Paul says in, in uh, I think in first, uh, some, somewhere in his epistles, if we have hope yeah. in this life only, yeah. we are me the most to, to be pitied. Yeah. It's only this life. There is nothing beyond this life. It's only what I'm feeling. It's only what I'm experiencing. There is nothing beyond it. So that's what maybe transcendence is. Transcendence is opposite to that. Yeah, opposite. Seeing beyond, see, be, seeing beyond the here and now, transcending time and space. And okay, and here you're not. And here, this is explaining the worldview of transcendent, like general transcendence. So you're not. So this is one of them. This is one of them. And the reason I brought this one here, because unfortunately, some people confuse this with Christianity. There is a Bible. There is God. He created the world, and. He can stay, you know, in heaven comfortably. We're going to call upon him when we need him. But he doesn't have to get involved in all the details of life. This this ter this worldview was given a name. It's called the moralistic therapeutic deism. And you can read about it. Very interesting. This is a term that was coined by a psychologist uh, in, in the States uh, maybe 20 years ago. And they surveyed uh, thousands of young people in the state. And that's what they came up with as their religion. So the the, the psychologist, my, the name escapes me, uh, coined it as a moralistic therapeutic theism. So moralistic because it's ha it has a set of morals. We have to be nice to each other, play fair. Uh, you know, you don't swear, you don't drink, you don't do bad things. Therapeutic, because it's good for you. You you deal with a set of rules and it's going to make you feel good about yourself and about your life. And the word deism, I think, is a, maybe the word that is a bit tricky. Is Deism is where the, the belief that God has created the world, but then he left it alone he left the world to itself and he he is not to get involved into the world he is indifferent to the world so that's what theism is so theism is what we believe that god and in christianity of course god interacts with the world but in theism is he's indifferent he created the world they believe that there is a creator he created the world but he leaves it to itself he doesn't reveal himself. He doesn't interact with the world. He just leaves it for itself. So that's sometimes we, I, I, I on purpose put this slide here because in this slide, which is unfortunately sometimes the belief adopted by a lot of the younger generation, younger people, there is no room for suffering. So when suffering gets thrown into the equation here, Everything goes a mess. Like the, the whole world view gets disrupted because it doesn't have any room for any room for suffering. Any questions or we're okay? Yeah, thanks for that explanation. Appreciate it. So I, I put I put this slide that maybe it looks like it's a little bit out of place, but it is important when we when we look at God as the genie that he created, but he can stay where he is and we call upon him when we need him. He gave us a set of rules in a Bible. If we follow those set of rules, we should live a happy life. He's happy that we're living a happy life. And then we die. Good people will go to heaven. Very simplistic kind of uh set of rules that make up a religion but that is of course that is not christianity and it believes in a god and that's why i i titled this slide not all transcendent is created equal not all the transcendent religions the religions that believe in a creator 
will arrive at the same conclusion. So from the outside, it looks like this person is Christian. They believe in God. God wants people to be happy. Uh, God uh, wants people to feel good about themselves. And they, we call upon him when we need him. And when we die, we go, we go to heaven. Unfortunately, if we don't scratch below the surface, this is where we stop at in, in a Christian faith. And this is evident by the number of youth surveyed in the States. And that's that was the collective description of their Christianity. Okay. So now that slide was just for that worldviews and how they explain or how they attempt to explain suffering. So if we have an angry God who's sitting to punish people, when when pain happens, when misfortune happens, it is a punishment. Suffering is a punishment because of that worldview. And if God is willing to, wants to punish people, and we happen to be adherent of that worldview, we can help him also punish people. So that's one, one worldview. The second is suffering is not real. Suffering is just an illusion. Suffering You suffer because you desire, but it's not real. And again, the, that does not explain suffering away because people are suffering. Even those who adopt this kind of worldview, they are living with suffering. They just try to convince themselves that suffering is not actually real. And the next one is suffering is evil. And that's where I, the very first slide when we were talking about if God exists, if God is all powerful, if God is all good, why evil exists? And they associate suffering with evil. But as we progress later, we're going to see that this is this doesn't deal with the situation. And suffering is pointless. Suffering is pointless is because we don't see a point in it. And if you uh, if you if you did uh, some research in this topic, you would come across this example. It's called the the no no see it, no see them versus the San Bernard. So it, basically, the 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 person who put this together, he says, if you go into a tent and there are tiny flies that go through the tent and someone asks you, is there any of those? And you look in the tent and say, uh, I don't see them. You cannot conclude 100% that there is no flies. There is no aphids or... But... If you have a St. Bernard dog, which is a very big dog in the tent, and you walk into the tent, and someone asks you, you say, yes, there is a St. Bernard here. But because sometimes people don't see the point behind suffering, they conclude that there is no point behind suffering. And that's, that's a very premature conclusion, and it's based on thinking that we are all knowing. If I don't see it, it doesn't exist, which is a, a, a flaw in the logic. If I don't see a point behind suffering, then suffering is pointless. This is very flawed in from the its its logical conclusion. But now we get to the our orthodox faith and dealing with suffering and. Uh, that's where I think for us, and I have a, a slide after where we're gonna look at how we deal with those who are outside and talking about suffering. But for us, in, in the Orthodox faith, God identifies with the suffering one. In, in Matthew chapter 25, uh, this is uh, the, the, from the Lord about the description of the second coming, he says, and the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, the least of my, the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. 
So here, he's not, he's not just sitting there saying, oh, it's nice to do good things to other people. He's actually saying, if you do, you know, you feed, you feed the hungry, you clothe the naked, you visit the imprisoned, you visit the sick. If you're doing that to them, you're actually doing it to me. He's identifying with the suffering person. He's not asking us just to do good things to people who happen to be less fortunate than us. He's saying that you're doing this to me, which is in, in our faith, God is identifying with the person who's, in, who's suffering, being imprisoned, being hungry, being uh, uh, stricken by a disease, being by any of them. The second point also for our Orthodox faith, God enters into suffering. God enters into suffering. Uh, they refer to uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam as the Abrahamic religions. We can have a totally separate discussion about this. But none of these religions has this in it. This is St. Paul in 1 Corinthians. He says, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In the, in the Christian faith, the center figure of the faith is a suffering person, is a person hung on a cross, is a person despised, is a person stricken by, by those who hate him, and for no good reason. It's all suffering. So this is central to the Christian message that we're not only looking at it from the outside, but we're looking at the central figure who defines what Christianity is as one who's suffering. For this is in Hebrews chapter two, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. He enters into suffering, not only as a display for suffering, but he's also able now to help those who are suffering. He doesn't only identify with the suffering, with the suffering one, he enters into suffering and he is able to help those who are suffering because he himself has suffered. But also God redeems suffering. So maybe before we read the verse, the worst kind of suffering is a pointless suffering. So let's say you, one of us falls off a stage in the school and breaks their arm. So, okay, they weren't looking in front of themselves. They trip and fall. That's fine, that, an, a broken arm. But what if this person, there was a fire in the school, and someone is trying to save them, pushes them off the stage, and they break their arm. Their, their uh, perception of their broken arm is totally different. Because their arm was broken in the process of being saved from a fire. But the one that fell off the stage, so okay, I wasn't paying attention. Or someone who was, you know, wearing a nice watch goes outside at night and, you know, they get ambushed and someone fight them and takes their watch and in that fight, their arm is broken. Or someone who's bullied and their arm is broken. These are all broken arms, one kind of suffering. The one that has, the more value it has, the more we're able to accept that suffering. The worst kind of suffering is a pointless suffering. You're walking in the streets and someone, just because they can, they approach you and you break your arm. This is pointless suffering. And this is the one that doesn't only break the arm, but also breaks the soul. Because we're not seeing any point behind. If I go and get a cast on my arm because I was saved from a fire, and I'm walking around, my soul is actually very, very satisfied, very, very 
uh, confident in what is happening. I am being watched over even with my arm in a cast because, because I was saved because of it. So God redeems suffering by showing that suffering can have a point behind it. Not all suffering is pointless. So suffering can be redeemed. It can lead to something better. So here Hebrews again, uh, chapter 12, St. Paul says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was put, uh, that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Christ, because he was looking at the joy that is set before him, redeeming us, redeeming his creation, bringing all of us to his father, because he has joy set before him, he's despising shame. He's enduring the cross. And if we look at suffering, that it has point behind it, it has a purpose behind it, suffering itself gets redeemed. Not every suffering is bad. The more, it, the more value it brings, the more the, the suffering itself is redeemed. And here St. Peter in his first letter says, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good, as to a faithful creator. And here there is a, a shocking phrase that there is suffering according to the will of God. I can suffer because of my choices. I can suffer because I made enemies wherever I go. I can suffer. There are so many ways of suffering that not according to the will of God. I can suffer because of my habits. I can suffer because of my, whatever, my uh, uh, my gluttony. My, there are so many things, so many reasons. I can suffer because I wasn't careful. But there is suffering that is according to the will of God. And that suffering that is according to the will of God is in doing good. Commit their souls to him in doing good. So now I want to talk quickly about approaching people who talk about, who approach us with questions about suffering. And I have four or five points that we want to avoid when we are, when we are answering to people about suffering. The one, the first one is the indifferent. When we have someone who who's who's actually suffering, being it a disease, being a, a lost, a broken relationship, being a result of uh, a natural disaster, whatever, the worst is being indifferent to that person. The worst is approaching the person as as an object, not as a human being who is suffering, and we are called to co-suffer with them. There is a lawyer. Oh, God is now under attack. And my job is to defend God. So whatever it takes, whatever argument I'm going to make, it's to defend God. But guess what? God doesn't need a defense. God will show himself. God will prove himself. We are, we are to be, again, co-sufferer with that person. And there is the judge. Oh, let me tell you, you did this, 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 and that, and that's why you are in this situation. You must have done this. You must have done something wrong. And the, the, the clearest example of this is Job. We have a whole book of Job who says, I don't know why I'm suffering. And his friends are talking to him and say, no, 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 you did something wrong and you're being punished. You're being punished by God. And then at one point in, 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 in the letter, in the book, he says, what a bunch of miserable comforters you are. You're not bringing me any comfort. You're, you're just miserable comfort because you're coming to judge. You're not coming to co-suffer. You're not coming to sit down in silence with me. And then there is the rational. So some, someone is suffering and we come to them with all kinds of logic. 
And those of us who are uh, hyperlogical people, we're going to explain to them, oh, but even if you're suffering from this, it's okay. Uh, there is something else that's going to happen. Or, uh, you know, a broken relationship. Oh, you know what? All, re all relationships break at the end. Don't worry about it. Like, we're just super rational. And we're trying through rationality to take away that suffering. But we are still called to be co-sufferer with the people. And then there is the know-it-all. I know why God did this. I know what you're doing. And we come just full of ourselves and explaining the mystery of suffering. Because at, at the end, the suffering remains for us Christians a mystery. And Christ entered into suffering, and we enter into suffering with him. The one that has that knows it all and explains, oh, the, God is teaching you a lesson, or God is teaching your family a lesson, or oh, don't worry about it, you're, you're going to be fine in uh, six months from now. You just you know find another job, find another uh, uh, place to live in. Uh, all of that is just coming across as knowing it all. That is the, the, the next one. In approaching people, in approaching people who are suffering, we have to be very, very careful from all these traps. If we have nothing to say, it's very good not to say anything. Just approach the person, acknowledge their suffering, and have sympathy for for their suffering and empathize with them as Christ did with us in in, uh, in his humanity so this is this is it for uh, for suffering uh, I hope I didn't make you suffer much sorry for the pun uh, but uh, I I would like to hear from you if we have few minutes I would like to hear from you what people that you're in in your ministry, on the streets, what kind of arguments people are bringing to you? I know, do we have time? Oh, yes, we do. Any feedback from the ministry, from the service? Well, actually, we, we I remember we had a question. We, like, not too long ago, we had a person that came up and he was just, like, blaming god for all what he's gone through like in like was very very angry with god hmm. very angry he got uh he said he mentioned he was molested when he was younger and perhaps with someone that he thought was um religious somehow hmm. and um he was just very angry with god and uh, approaching him was pretty hard and uh, you mentioned what ways we shouldn't approach? I want if you can elaborate. What ways should be like? What would be your answer in general, like to someone who's very angry with God because of all what he's going through in life? Um, I, I completely agree with all the points you've mentioned, but sometimes you think you need to say something. I'm not sure. Like, mm. like there's still so something I, that you need yeah. to say. I guess. I uh, know. I know. We're we. Uh, uh, a a story, story I heard about. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna to add to to share this question. Is sure. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Given given also that sometimes um, time is tight, or or we want uh, it's a person that we might be seeing only once. Mm. So what should be our focus message that we live with him that. The, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the yes. focus has to be a focus message. So, what message do you want to leave with? Yes. So, the uh, uh, very, very valid question. Very valid question. You wanna, you wanna relieve them from that burden, but you also wanna exonerate God. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. We say, no, no, God is not that bad. You got it wrong. So we're almost wanna defend the God. But a beautiful yeah. story, I, I, a beautiful story I heard. I heard about Abu Khail Ibrahim, whose whose commemoration was a couple of days ago. Uh, a lady came to him for confession or for guidance, and she told him about all the abuse that 
she is being subjected to from her husband, physical abuse and all of that. Abuna sat down and heard all what she's saying, and he cried with her. He just cried with her. He said, Lord, have may the Lord have mercy on you and me, my daughter. And I mean, he's a, he's a very saintly, very saintly man who had who left a lasting impression on a lot of people. And at one point, all what he was able to do is just cry with her. Because we we have to trust that this person is still in the hands of God. We're not going to be the ones that are going to completely turn their lives around. We're just going to leave a seed with them. And that seed that we're going to leave with them is compassion. We just leave compassion with them. And that's enough. And next round, another person, because God is faithful. God is faithful. He's going to send another one. And when we, when we, uh, God willing, we go to heaven, we meet this person. And he is going to tell us how he met Christ afterwards. Eh? I'm sorry, I don't have like good, solid, oh, rational answers because it's a, it's a fair answer. It's a fair answer. But, but I think you mentioned something that kind of, it's a bit of an argument here now that you mentioned that the worst suffering is the pointless suffering. So let me ask this question. I'm not sure if it's the correct question to ask. So what is that like? So the question would be, so what is the point of suffering? I'm not sure. Like I kind of was expecting to hear the answer to that question. If that makes sense. I mean, as a Christian, maybe I, I can have some rational reasons for that, but I, I'd like to hear that from you as well. If if this is actually a correct question to answer, to ask. It is it is a correct question to ask, and people get crushed by a pointless suffering. There is a, a, a very good book, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, I think he's... he's uh, Viktor Frankl is the, he's a Jewish psychologist, and he was in the concentration camps during the the Nazi Germany time. And he wrote this book, uh, "Man's Search for Meaning," and he emphasizes the the fact that people are redeemed when they know that there is there is something good that will come from their suffering. Again, it's very hard, as Kamel was saying. It's two or three minutes exchange with a person to help them to see that there is meaning behind their suffering. It's hard. And especially when that suffering is coming from abuse, suffering coming from uh, betrayal in relationships, that is, that is very, very hard to answer in two or three minutes discussion. But what we can do, we can extend a merciful hand to the person. We're just extending a merciful hand. But there is something good today. And that's it. Sorry, so question. So as Christians, do we believe that all suffering is meaningful? Like, do we believe that every bad thing that happens has a meaning and there is a reason to why this is happening and so on? Or, or not? Okay, so... There is, there is suffering that we bring upon ourselves. I mean, I, did, I wasn't paying attention and I closed the door on my finger and I broke my finger. That is suffering, but I'm not going to gauge this as part of suffering. It's just being, being careless. Right, but, but like things that are out of our hands, let's say. Things, things are, that are out of our hands. So we, there is... A, God can redeem that suffering. It's not us that can redeem this suffering. And the redemption of the suffering is that meaning comes out of it. We have, we have Job, and our church also is very, very wise that we read the lamentation of Jeremiah on Good Friday. Huh? If you go back and read lamentation, it's, it's, Someone who's who's just questioning, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? David, I think in Psalm 10, he says, 
Why do you hide in the times of adversity? Why are you hiding? Why do you stand afar? He's talking to God. Eh? And that is the question that a believer can ask. That can struggle with God. There was a story, I'm sure you, you maybe some of you heard it about that lady that uh, lost her son, I think. And Abu Nabshoi was visiting her, Abu Nabshoi Cameron. And she she used to have a picture of Christ on her wall. And she took the picture down. And he says, what is the picture? And she says, no, no, I'm not talking to him anymore. He took my son. And after arguing and arguing, not arguing, but trying to talk with her, he, she got convinced to put the picture on the wall, but turn it backwards. So make Christ face the wall. She doesn't want to look at him. And days after... She started talking to him. I mean, I feel bad. I have your <laughs> picture turned against the wall. And eventually she was able to, to bring the picture back and talk to him. So that struggle, we, we don't take it away. We don't take away the struggle. But when we don't understand, and that's maybe a point that we, when we don't understand, we trust in the character of God. We don't understand everything. But this is when faith kicks in. And then I don't understand the circumstances. But I trust in your character. Because we believe in that personal God. Because circumstances can be very confusing. Young, young kid dies from cancer. Older person, 105, still living. And they don't even know that they're still living. And what is happening here? But when, when circumstances become that confusing, there is trust in the character of God. And that's faith. Trusting in his character. That he's not sitting. You know, that I, I don't know if I talked to you about this last time. You know, the picture, it's usually shared, I think, with a good intention. I don't like it. Where the two stones are crushing a person and then there is a finger from top, keeping the stones away that the person is not completely crushed. I don't know if you've seen that. It's like God is protecting the person. But I think God is being squeezed with the person between those two stones. God is not like sitting far from us. He's identifying with us in our suffering, in our afflictions. And in, in trusting in that character, the, the suffering is redeemed. Sorry, one last question. So by saying that trusting in God's char character, okay, like, like, of course, we all believe that God is suffering with us and so on. So you don't necessarily mean that something good will come out of this suffering. You mean that we're trusting that God is identifying with us and is being crushed with us and so on. And not necessarily that something good will happen. Well, that's what is the ultimate good. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate good is going to come out of it. Now, suffering, we didn't talk about uh, uh, is God causing the suffering. Of course, some basil has uh, a long writing about that the God is not the, the source or the, the one that causes evil. God is not the source of evil. So evil will come. But the the ultimate good is our salvation. Now, St. Paul in Hebrews says, not everyone who's being chastised feels uh, happy about being chastised. But chastisement on the long run will build that sonship and daughtership to God. And he says, there is no father who will not chastise his son, but our our earthly fathers chastised us as they deemed fit in their own eyes. But our heavenly father is chastising us and building us for that heavenly sonship and heavenly daughtership. So our subjection to him, knowing that not every not every suffering is suffering is caused by by living in a fallen world suffering is is uh, experienced because i'm also still have my 
the old man acting, wanting, uh, desiring what that's not what is not mine, pursuing what is not mine, pursuing selfish uh, goals and desires, and all of that creates also creates suffering. So we're carrying all of that. I see. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Well, first of all, thank you for the lovely talk. Um, I I was wondering, what are some practical phrases or sentences we can say to the people we meet who share a struggle with us? Because I have a couple that I like. I often recycle. Like, um, I often tell them, like, like God hasn't forgotten about you. Um, but I know there's so there's so much more that I can share with them. And I'd like to hear from your perspective, what is most comforting to someone who's going through something and for them to really, you know, see the hand of God working? Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's a tough one again for, because the time that you have with them is very, is very limited. You don't know their background. You don't know what, what picture they have about God because some people will live oh I messed up when I was 15 years old they are 60 or 70 years old now living in, in whatever hardship that comes their way and all what is on their mind I am being punished for what I did when I was 15 uh, I don't know I don't think you're, you will be able to but it's God is sending, God did not forget about you. God is sending you uh, his love. Uh, God is good. Uh, and again, you're not, I think our struggle is we want to see immediate results. But you might walk away from this person and that heavenly touch that came through you to them, even with a physical uh good being it uh, clothing or or uh, a meal or sharing a song with them or that is the hand we believe that this is the hand of god touching them they are less suffering at this point because of that so it's just god is visiting them god is visiting, visiting them through you uh, and whatever is put on your heart i don't think you have to uh, I mean, it's good to have a couple of answers, but you will speak to a person. You will be speaking to a person. So reach out to them in their circumstance. If it's if it's someone who's who's suffering from from abuse, we can say that God hears you. God sees you. God did not abandon you. Uh, if you have a, a longer time window to, to discuss with them we never judge a movie or we should not judge a movie by the first five minutes of it you don't know how the movie is gonna unravel or how the movie is gonna uh, play out so you're still here and you're not done there is more in life but there are people who are really really suffering in, in a very very deep uh very deep uh, like layers of suffering so you will i don't think in in that five minutes encounter with them you will be able but you made less you made them less suffering by that touch this touch is from god to them whatever you're providing them with at that time thank you so much for the insight It's not. It's not easy. It's not easy. I. Um, but and 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 our faith. We know that suffering was not brushed off. Suffering was not ignored. Suffering was fully embraced by Christ. He embraced suffering fully, head on, and from that suffering came the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, we would not. We would not. Uh, uh, bow down before the cross. We would not honor the cross it's because of the resurrection that the cross and the resurrection they are 
two sides of one coin. Whenever we separate the resurrection from the cross, we do both of them at the service. So that that coin, that with the cross there is a resurrection, and the cross is the way to the resurrection. And the resurrection is so meaningful before, because of the cross. Yes. I know we went over time. Uh, no, sorry no, about that. That. no, no, thank you so much. I really appreciate the, that last point, actually, the connecting our suffering with the resurrection, connecting the the idea that Jesus had also said that um, if the seed does not fall into the ground and uh, it will not grow. And it will just remain uh, useless. But it's through that... Uh, suffering of the seed that's when it grows and uh, through the cross then we see the resurrection um, but i also think that you you clarified a good point too that it's not all suffering like as you mentioned earlier not all transcendence are created equal not all suffering are equal because sometimes suffering could still be because of things that i'm choosing to follow uh, and um, I'm not learning from that, but again, if if we if we put our suffering, as you had um, mentioned in Hebrews, put it in God's hands, then that's when it starts to become meaningful. If if I if I got this correctly, uh, please correct me if if uh, if I'm mistaken on understanding this. So suffering will be meaningful. Basically, what I'm trying to say is suffering will be meaningful once we put it in God's hands, but it could continue to be meaningless away from God. If, the, if is that making sense? Yes, yes, yes. Of course, of course. And maybe if I'm trying I, to actually answer, like, the, like I think Laura brought a good point about whether if all suffering has a purpose or a meaning. But I think it only becomes meaningful when it's in God's hands, and that's when it becomes a, a way to the salvation, a way for resurrection. Yeah. And I, I just remember now as when you were talking. When in Tazbah we sing the song of the three saintly youth. Mm. And what are the three saintly youth are saying? It's not in the King James Bible, but it's in our Bible, the, the praise of the three saintly youth that we sing in, in, in Tazbah. And what are they saying? They are asking and calling all creation to praise God while they are in the midst of, of the fire and calling upon all creation. To praise God turns that fire into that walk in the garden that they were in because the son of God or the son of man was the fourth one with them in the fire. But they were walking, but they are not just walking focused on their suffering. They are calling on creation to praise God. And that redeemed the suffering. And that's why in Tazbah we sing it, by the way. To, to all, all the burdens of the day, all the burdens of life were, are brought in and transformed through giving praise to God, not only us praising God, but we're asking also the rest of his creation to praise him. Yeah, actually, I, I just heard something about this idea. Thanks for bringing it up. It's, it's like when we're running away from the cross, is we're running away from Jesus himself. Like when you're not, if the three youth decided to walk away from the fire, they would have never met Jesus. They would never met or had this wonderful encounter. It's, I think it's that step of faith. It's the step of accepting the cross and then we will meet Jesus. Then we will, because that's where he is on the cross to carry it for us and uh, with us. And with the people, I'm sure you're seeing a lot of examples in your service with 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 the, you know, the broken people. The co we are co-sufferers. We have to be reconciled or reconciled with our own suffering, and not afraid to ask those questions. Because sometimes, as believers, we're worried to ask those questions. I know where I'm going to land with this question, so let me just brush it off or. Think that or or imagine that there is no suffering. But the more we get in touch with our own suffering, with our own brokenness, I think will be easy easier to be used in God's hand 
to co-suffer and minister to those who are in suffering. Because we don't come to them from above. We don't land on them to preach to them. We're just co-sufferers with them. We're, we're carrying that suffering together with them. In, in as little or as much capacity as the time and space allows us. Yeah, I don't want to take too much longer, but it reminds me again what you're saying with the Second Corinthians 1 when he says, Blessed be the God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and God of all comforts, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. It's exactly what you're saying. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God, who comforts us in all tri our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted from God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Amen. For Look how many times the word comfort is, is uh, you know, mentioned in this, like four or five verses. Yes. Yeah. That's the second Corinthians Corinthians one. Chapter one, yes. Yeah, one three to five. Yeah. So thank you so much, Uncle Joe, one more time. Thank uh, you. Thank you. I'm going to conclude. You're blessing me with a very, very difficult topics, but I I take it. <laughs> we have I take it there like, are uh, ten uh, questions. I guess now we, we've covered number one. <laughs> We're gonna every we month. just touched on number one. I'm not gonna talk about it. That's it, done. <laughs> Okay, we're God willing, we'll see you soon for questions two, three, and four. And by God's grace, we'll have many Thank more you. meetings together. Please pray for Thank us you. always. You can actually conclude for, well. with a small prayer. And then, uh, guys, please uh, hang on uh, because we want to quickly go through some points for our service on this Saturday, please. Sorry to keep you all waiting. Please conclude for us with a small prayer. Your Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your uh, bearing with us, bearing with us in our ignorance, bearing with us in our questioning, bearing with us in our uh, crying and not understanding. But uh, we lift up our voices as the baby who's weaned from its mother. We don't know why we're uh, troubled but we trust that in your character we trust in your eternal love we trust that you have sent your only begotten son entered into our world became one of us lived with us suffered with us died with us and rose and gave us his resurrection in that we pray and that we are encouraged and that we serve and that we minister and that we spread the gospel, your good news, that death has been defeated. Watch over us, watch over the service. Let everything that is being done to be done in love and for the glory of your holy name and for the expanding of your kingdom. Watch over the service and bless everyone who's uh, involved with it in it in every in any capacity through the intercessions of the mother of God, St. Mary, Daniel the prophet, and the three courageous saintly youth, and all the choir of your saints, hear us when we pray, our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us the evil one, in Christ Jesus our Lord, for you is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Thank you so much again. Thank you.